Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our special coverage of Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan's State of the City Address. Just a couple of minutes here, he will be speaking before a crowd at the Second Ebenezer Church. He will no doubt talk about what's been successful over the past year, and he'll spend even more time than that on what we can expect in the future. And you know, Devin, he could have picked any location around yeah. the city, especially downtown, but once again, the mayor is taking his annual address out of downtown and into the neighborhoods. This one on the city's east side. Now, one of the chief complaints in the neighborhoods is the block. And that's expected to be a topic that Duggan will touch on tonight. We also expect he will talk a good bit about the situation involving Detroit schools, the education picture, especially after the protests, of course, that we've seen by teachers about conditions in the schools, the sick outs. Uh, the mayor is also expected to talk about this newly unveiled mortgage plan uh, that we've heard so much about in the past week. He'll also no doubt talk about crime in the city. Spokesperson says he'll lay out actual blueprints on getting things done. And interesting here tonight, uh, this also surrounding this address, uh, we have sort of an opera, what they're calling an opportunity fair. Lots of booths uh, to help the people who've come out tonight to be a part of this to talk about things about crime, about services in the neighborhood, about uh, these mortgages and mortgage relief things like that. And some are concerned that it may uh, spur a, another collapse in the housing industry, but I'm sure that he's going to lay out his plan for this for this new mortgage plan to to spur growth in housing sales here in the city of Detroit. You are looking at a live picture right now of Second Ebenezer Baptist Church and as we watch some of the city council members, I see them uh, making their way to the stage tonight to uh, to sit for the state of the city address and uh, it looks like a packed house. Brenda Jones there, Andre Spivey uh, then coming out, James Tate uh, you just saw walk past, there's uh, Councilman Spivey. Uh, so you'll get the, uh, the council seated here in just a moment. Uh, we recall last year's address uh, from the mayor spent an awful lot of time talking about what was going on in the neighborhoods. He, is, uh, he knows that that has uh, really been a, a key sticking point for a lot of Detroiters, that there's so much focus on a lot of good things happening in downtown, in midtown. Uh, in fact, right, watching right now this enormous Red Wings arena taking shape before our very eyes just a few blocks from here on Woodward. Uh, but the mayor has been trying to keep his focus and I think uh, keeping the media's focus as well on what he's been doing in the neighborhoods where Detroiters are living their well, lives. And I, I think, to be honest, I mean, the rejuvenation of the city or regentrification of the city has to start somewhere. And certainly from the river on out is one way of looking at it. But the neighborhoods cannot be overlooked. And we know that they are important. They are the, the lifeblood of this city, you know, both neighborhoods on the, both sides of Woodward, on the east side and the west side as well. And certainly we've got a, uh, a mass transit system that may spur even more growth yep. as we look toward the, uh, the new M1 rail that's going to go down Woodward Avenue. Getting closer and closer to the moment that that's open. And of course, a lot of businesses along Woodward really eager to get that plan because if, if you've done any shopping along there, it's been a bit of a hardship for them uh, trying to manage with all the construction we're moving right down the street. And making sure that everybody's included in this growth and this new Detroit, that there aren't two separate cities that it's a city that serves everybody's needs and welcomes everyone is That's, inclusive in fact that very topic is going to be the issue for a, a, a panel that uh, Nolan Finley and I will be uh, hosting tomorrow afternoon as the Detroit Regional Chamber uh, devotes an entire day to Detroit issues going on at the Motor City Casino we'll have more on that tomorrow I want to quickly tell you while we watch the invocation being delivered here as well uh, at the conclusion of tonight's address by the mayor will be joined by uh, Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson We'll talk about what we've heard there tonight. And then, uh, after we've uh, wrapped up this evening's coverage, we would invite you to join us over on clickondetroit.com as we'll continue our conversation there. It's going to feel like an episode of Flashpoint. Absolutely. I certainly For a Tuesday so. night. <laughs> <laughs> but we are awaiting uh, Mayor Mike Duggan's State of the City address here, uh, set to start at 7 o'clock. But certainly, the, uh, our coverage has certainly started. And uh, if you're listening to the, the invocation at Second Ebenezer Baptist Church, uh, you can see it from I. 75 when you're headed north, uh, uh, going towards six mile and seven mile roads uh, out of the city of Detroit or toward the north part of the city of Detroit. And it's a large, large monument. And, uh, and it's packed tonight with a, yes, a lot is. of folks there as well. Uh, we uh, also uh, welcome those of you who are watching right now online as we stream this live for you on clickondetroit.com. Uh, again, the mayor's, we, we have not been given an advanced copy yet of the mayor's address. I don't think uh, he does that, does uh, he? Uh, not usually? Every once in a while you like to hear <laughs> a little bit about what we to expect. We would like to know. We have been told about some of the topics, yes. and that's why we, we mentioned earlier we know we're going to hear something more about mortgages. We will certainly be hearing more about the education as that's being debated 
considered right now in both sides of the legislature in Lansing. The governor has his own plan. The mayor has already weighed in. He hasn't exactly been eager to take and put to schools on his plate, as he keeps telling us. Uh, he has enough to do with what but he already has. I don't think has. he could avoid it, especially it's, with the with this teacher sick outs that were continuing on some with a so regularity here in the Detroit system. That's really the question that people keep asking. If not the mayor, then who? Who is go who has the kind of authority uh, to lead? As we know, Darnell Early uh, stepping down as the emergency manager of Detroit Public Schools, and now we all wait to see exactly where the leadership part of DPS goes. Uh, the DP the emergency manager system has not been exactly popular uh, among Detroiters, uh, and yet the mayor the governor has to convince outstate legislators uh, that that uh, there is enough accountability there to also create this money, this pile of money that needs to exist on the so-called uh, two-system, uh, two-district answer where one district is set up to only address the enormous debt and Detroit public schools are due to run out of money in April. And so this is a, there's is a terrible urgency to what's going certainly on Certainly a major topic, but I don't think I have actually sat through a state of the city address where I haven't heard Detroit and the crime rate in the city of Detroit and yeah. it has to be addressed. We know that Mayor Duggan is not going to skirt that issue as well because it is a concern not just of people in the neighborhoods but certainly throughout the city of Detroit. How do you get a handle on it? How do you rein it in? How do you make not just the schools uh, Quality, offering quality education for Detroit school children, but also safer neighborhoods and healthy environments to raise our children as well. The uh, introduction to the mayor is being made right now. That's City Councilman Scott Benson, and there we mentioned earlier, that is an enormous church, and you can see yeah. it is filled uh, tonight uh, for this address. Requested to expand its hazardous waste stores footprint and bring radioactive waste into the southern part of the district. My office worked with the residents to organize our Detroit like County, another. state, and federal elected officials in opposition. And as of today, this permit has still not been approved, leveraging our resources. In fact, yes, starting to allude to another issue we would expect These will come up tonight, and that's the complaints of those who live around uh, the Marathon facility in southwest Detroit. Uh, very upset about uh, what they're being told, the plans for expansion there, uh, not trusting uh, what they're hearing from the Department of Environmental Quality. The MDEQ has not had a great year, uh, go, a great couple of months, going back to everything that's happened in Flint. And the trust level right now uh, among the citizenry and their government is struggling. And that's a section of the city that uh, has put up with a, a lot, even though it's, uh, you know, been a picture of what industrialized Detroit looks like because you, you've got your rouge plant there, you've got your refineries there, but this is a, a, a concern, a health concern of people who live in that neighborhood as well. This is uh, unlike, I would say, the Duggan administration. Typically, when they tell you it's going to start at 7 o'clock, they're underway at 7 o'clock. Well, it looks like we're getting ready to hear. And now we're going to have the national anthem, so we'll listen into that. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming Still there, oh, 
Lovely rendition nice of our national done, anthem yeah. to start the evening here, and we would expect now this to get underway. If you're just joining us, you are just about to hear Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan and his annual State of the City address. This will be his third Mike such address, Duggan. and they have just introduced him, and here he comes. Council. You see him acknowledging uh, members of city council there, and you know, just looking, the chief of police is there. I don't know what other special guest he's invited to uh, the State of the City address, but we will... Uh, Thank you so much. Take a listen. I want to start by thanking our hosts this evening, uh, Bishop Edgar Van and Elder Sheila Van and the Second Ebenezer community. Thank you for having us in your beautiful home, uh, and to Councilman Scott Benson, who repeatedly extended the invitation. I think he set a precedent. I'm sure it's been a long time since the mayor of Detroit delivered the state of the city on the east side. Thank you for the invitation. You know, it wasn't that long ago uh, that you turn on the TV and you would see the mayor and the council bitterly fighting uh, as the city spiraled into bankruptcy. What you're seeing today is very different. You see a mayor and a council working in partnership to rebuild this city. And I'm going to start today the way I start all my speeches, by introducing the partners, because everything we're talking about today is only possible because we're working together. And we have to start with our leader, the person who's restored professionalism and civility to council meetings and made his people be proud of the Detroit City Council again, Council President Brenda Jones. It's okay, she's great. This council's strongest voice for creating job opportunities for returning citizens and giving them a real role in Detroit's recovery, Council Member Janae Ayers. The councilman who's taken the leader in foreclosure prevention, going out himself and knocking on doors, telling how people they can stay in their homes, Councilman Gabe Leland. Maybe the most energetic council person I've ever met. Uh, the co-chair of the Immigration Task Force. By her force of personality this year, Detroit is going to start issuing municipal ID cards to citizens who don't have them. Council member Raquel Castaneda Lopez. A woman who's going to be very busy this year with three elections. We have to remember to vote three times. Uh, we're very lucky to have her, our outstanding city clerk, Janice Winfrey. <laughs> On this side, the financial leader of the city council, the person who keeps the budget straight, uh, a force for the balanced budgets we have today, President Pro Tem George Cushingberry. Our leader on every economic development and jobs issue, the councilman from this district, Scott Benson. The person you can always count to stand up for affordable housing for the homeless who goes out herself on pit count night to count the homeless in our community, council member Mary Sheffield. The man who sponsored the first ordinance to put cameras in our gas station that led to what we have today is the extremely successful Greenlight Project, Councilman Andre Spivey. 
and the man responsible for the fact we're finally going to start shutting down marijuana dispensaries in the city of Detroit, Councilman James State. You can see the difference of talents and interests, and by all working together, we are getting to where we want to be. And as we stand here together tonight, we're all proud that our progress in Detroit's comeback is drawing positive attention from across America and is inspiring hope and optimism across Detroit. But every one of us is well aware that there are sections of the city that are not feeling the recovery yet. We know we've just started. We know we've got a long way to go and we're going to do it together. But tonight, let's start with the successes. And the most obvious success you notice driving up here, which is the streetlights. Okay? Remember when it seemed impossible to get streetlights on in the city of Detroit? In the last two years, uh, Lorna Thomas and the Public Lighting Authority and that team there has put on 61,000 lights. They're going to finish this spring more than a year ahead of schedule. There was a time when the ambulance response time in this town was the worst in America, more than 18 minutes. Two years later, it's been cut in half and is now reaching the national standard of eight minutes. We're so proud of what our EMTs are doing. And, and not only are our EMTs getting there faster, but our firefighters are being cross-trained as medical first responders because sometimes when you're having that heart attack, the closest vehicle to you isn't the ambulance, it's the fire station and the firehouse next door. And we have had several cases where we've saved lives with a critical intervention. And I want to say to our firefighters and our EMTs tonight, I know that the police and fire in this city, these officers who put their lives on the line, are paid significantly less than their colleagues in the surrounding communities. We took a step in the right direction with the police department last December, and I will tell you this year we're going to find a way to recognize your contribution and start to improve your pay for all of our firefighters and EMTs. And the buses are running on schedule for the first time in nearly 20 years. Just took a little help from Vice President Joe Biden and about 80 new buses, uh, new drivers, new cameras on the buses, transit police, and help from our state legislators. The Detroit legislators helped change the law so we can put more road money into transits, which is allowing us to add 24 hour service on Woodward and Grash and Grand River, and we're going to extend that 24 hour service to several other routes in this city this year. And here's a fascinating statistic. We are now we are now taking more than 100,000 passengers a week more than we did last year, riding the DDOT buses. But the single greatest difference might be one you don't see every day, and that's the one that involves managing our finances. We finished the last fiscal year, June 30th, 2015, with a balanced budget for the first time since 2002. We're now four months from the end of this fiscal year, 2016. Our revenues are ahead of budget, our expenses are under budget, and we're going to finish with a balanced budget for the second straight year. Yeah. And this week, we're going to send council uh, a budget for 2017, and it will be balanced for the third straight year. We're finally bringing financial discipline to this community. But I have to tell you, uh, everything on the financial front is not rosy. Uh, we do have some clouds looming. I know uh, my colleagues up here know this, and we're just going to have to deal with it. Uh, and, and the cloud that's looming is that the latest report shows we have a $491 million deficit in our pension fund, which starts to come due in 2024. Now, you might say, 2024, why are you talking to us about it today? Uh, but but the way that you deal with these problems is not a crisis today, it's a problem today, is you start to deal with it early, you deal with it honestly, and we can manage it. And the other reason we start talking about it today is we are going to keep our pension fund solvent. We are going to keep our promise to our retirees. It's been broken once, and we're going to make darn sure it never gets broken again. The second question is, how could this happen? 
And that question is a lot more disturbing because when we left bankruptcy, the emergency manager and the consultants left us with a plan of adjustment that said the pension fund would be fully funded. And just months later, the independent analysis showed there was a shortfall. Our CFO, John Hill, is digging into this along with the State Financial Review Commission. But preliminarily, it looks to be this. It looks like the emergency and the manager and the consultants used the wrong assumptions. I mean, it's just, it is hard to believe, and I hope this turns out not to be true, but it does appear that way, that in particular, they used outdated mortality tables. They assumed people were not going to live as long as they were to make the numbers look more favorable. And so we're going to have to address this problem. And so we're going to do it honestly and forthrightly. And here's what we're going to do. One, we're not going to panic. This is an issue for 2024, and we're going to get on top of it now. It's a manageable issue. Two, we are not asking anybody for a bailout, okay? right? We have said all along we want the right to self-determination. Uh, this wasn't a problem of our creation, but we're going to manage it, and we aren't going to anybody ask them to bail us out. Third, We're going to start putting in money right now. The 2016 budget is doing so well, we're in a position to put an additional $10 million in. And the budget that I'm sending to council this week will put another $10 million in next year. And on top of that, John Hill and the Financial Review Commission are going to be bringing in a national expert. It's not that cities in America haven't dealt with this problem. We're going to deal with it very thoughtfully. Fourth, I have directed Chuck Ramey, our chief litigation officer, to review any possible legal claims against the consultants. I want to know how we could have paid these guys $177 million for the work they did. And once they're out of town, there's a $491 million haul just a few months later. I don't know whether it's actionable or not, but uh, we're going to pursue it if there's any way we can. But our, but our biggest focus is going to be this. It's 2016 and we have eight years. The best way to be able to handle this problem is to grow the city. It's to get people to come back. It's to get businesses to come back. It's to get revenues up so that well ahead of 2024, we have succeeded so far we can manage this. That's what a growing city is going to do. And tonight I want to talk to you about what I think we can do to grow the city. And in my mind, there are five things, and they're all going to fit together. We've got to get the violent crime down. Right? We got to remove the blight. We got to add jobs and business so everybody in Detroit has an opportunity. We got to cut the car insurance rates and we got to provide quality schools. If we could do those things, how much better would this city be? And the thing is, I believe that the team that you're looking here, along with our partners in Lansing and Washington, can do just that. When it comes to the police department, the very first thing I want to say is thank you to the men and women of the Detroit Police Department for the outstanding job that they're doing. And thank you to Chief James Craig, who I consider to be one of the finest police chiefs in America. Everything in policing starts with trust from the community. And that's why I was so pleased when the chief and the police officers unions came forward and volunteered we are going to be one of the first cities in America to demonstrate that body cameras work, that we can show people what these interactions actually occur. And in this year, we're going to start rolling them out and putting them on officers because we're confident of our men and women. And all we want to know is in each incident is what's the truth, and we'll stand behind it. Trust also requires an independent civilian board of police commissioners. And that board's powers had been suspended by the emergency manager. But I was very pleased when City Council in December, on the earliest possible date, voted to restore the full power to those police commissioners. They are an essential part of our public safety strategy, and I want to introduce them now. First, he has the privilege of being the host, one of the police commissioners, Bishop Edgar Van. The chair of the police commission, Lisa Carter. Vice chair, Willie Bell. 
and Commissioners Richard Shelby, Reginald Crawford, Willie Burton, Ricardo Moore, Conrad Mallet, Eva Garza de Walsh, Betty Brooks, and Derek Sanders. We are so pleased to be working with you. And the police commissioners will be glad to know our first order of business is put more officers on the street. Okay? Last year, we hired more than 100 police officers, got them on the street, and we took another 100 officers who were in desk jobs like dispatching and moved them to patrol and to other law enforcement positions. But it wasn't enough. It kept ahead of the retirements, but not much more. And the reason, uh, and the reason, I'm a great believer in free speech, but that was a little much. Uh, we wanted to put more police officers on the street last year, but we couldn't hire them because we were only paying $31,000 for starting officers. With the agreement we reached in December, that starting salary is now up to $36,000. We're starting to fill the academies with the new payroll system. We're going to take officers who are doing timekeeping payroll, move them back to the streets. We're going to put 200 more officers on the streets this year and give a quicker response time to Chief Craig and the team. And when those officers are on the street, we are going to back them with the latest technology, the best technology any police department's had. And we started, if you've seen it, with the Green Light Initiative, something that Councilman Spivey initi initiated originally and Chief Craig. But here's what we did. We went to gas station owners, places where people feel vulnerable in the city. And we said, we'd like you to light your gas station so bright you can read a magazine all the way to the edge. We want high-definition color cameras that you'll send by internet to police headquarters, and we will monitor your police station on a real-time basis from headquarters. We're in the early stages. Nobody's tried it this way. It's been about six weeks, and the results have already been remarkable. Uh, we had an instance right off the bat where somebody was shot and said that the person who shot him he had seen earlier at the gas station. They went up to the gas station, found his color picture on the gas station camera, had him arrested within a matter of hours. We had an incident where a little boy crossing the street was hit by a taxi and a hit and run driver. But the camera from all the way across the street was so vivid, it caught the driver, and that hit and run driver has been arrested and is now in jail. And this weekend, one of our officers at headquarters saw a car pull in to one of these gas stations to get gas, and something just seemed funny about it. They looked it up, it turned out it was a car that had been carjacked in Southfield two days before. They called in the patrol car, and they arrested the alleged carjacker because he got his gas at the wrong gas station. And Chief Craig and I love watching some of these videos because you'll see two guys in the gas station start to push each other. And one of them will point up at the sign saying, monitor to the police headquarters. And they go, OK. <laughs> and they'll head out. We now have 34 more gas stations, party stores, uh, drive through restaurants ready to go. We're going to add four per week. And we'll have between 100 and 200 locations in this city. We're going after gun violence in a different way. We're doing it in a program that we call ceasefire, something that was modeled in Boston. And we're doing it in partnership with Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy uh, and with U.S. Attorney Barb McQuaid. And ceasefire is an amazing thing. We started in the 5th and 9th Precinct, the east side of Detroit, the most violent sections of this city. And what we do is this. We call in gang members who are on probation, on parole. They're ordered by court. They come in and sit in a room in a church, about 30 of them in the front. And the chief and I and, and some ministers and the like uh, and the U.S. attorney are there. And then there's a whole group of community around him. 
and we bring these young men in, and so far, the ones I've been at, they've been young men, and we say to them, we don't want to arrest you. We don't want to lock you up, but you're on a bad path, and we, you have two choices. We now have a database of gun offenses and gang offenses, and we've got the full force of the federal, county, and city governments, and if you commit another crime, we're coming after you. On the other hand, we have a whole group of folks here in social services and job training, and if you choose that alternative, we will support you in changing your life, right? Never going to work, right? You, you, and it, it's a little tense. You're sitting there looking at 30 gang members, uh, and it doesn't always work. And we had one who we intervened with last July, who we said, you're on a wrong path. Uh, you need to get off it. An 18-year-old young man, in December, he was arrested for murdering a 17-year-old at the East Lamb Mall. We lost two lives that day, the 17-year-old who was killed and the 18-year-old who, if he's convicted, will spend the rest of his life in prison. And it's a reminder of what we had at stake. But this November call-in was pretty remarkable. We're starting to see, turn. We, have, we actually have people who aren't being ordered to come in who are coming in voluntarily. The national ceasefire people said they never saw that before. But in this last group, we had one young man who's gotten a job now. He's working on 8 Mile in a retail store. We got another young man in an office in Redford. Another one. These are all from the November call-in who was working at a manufacturing facility in the western part of Wayne County and just got promoted to lead on his line. There's some talent in here that we are losing in this city. And my favorite was a young man that night who came up to me and told me uh, that he was going to take it to heart, he was going to go back to school. And I have to say I was a little skeptical, and I've gotten a report that in January he started college at a small school in the South. We are having some effect. But for those who are not listening, uh, we have had the full force of the U.S. Attorney's Office prosecuting multiple people from the Seven Mile Bloods. Kim Worthy and her team have, have had gun prosecutors with us every step of the way. And so it sounds good. How are we doing? Well, you know I'm into metrics. So the first two months of this year, shootings and homicides, we have 12 precincts in the city. Shootings and homicides are just about where they were last year, except in the fifth and ninth precinct combined, the shootings and homicides are down 30% from a year ago. The ninth precinct is especially amazing. It was far and away the most violent precinct in this city last year, and at this time this year, it's one of the lowest in homicides. What we're doing, I believe, is starting to work, and in April, the f Chief Craig and the U.S. Attorney and the prosecutor are taking this to two precincts on the west side. And we're going to keep going. We're going to deliver a clear message that if you use a gun in a crime, we're coming after you. If you want to change your life, this whole community will wrap their arms around you, and we're going to see if we can't change the direction. For those uh, who don't, however, we've got more resources. There are more than 1,000 individuals today with an outstanding warrant in the city of Detroit for a gun crime. They're carjackers, they're armed robbers, uh, they're shooters, they carry concealed weapons. We have not in the past had the resources to go after them. And so you can see what's happening. People think, ah, I can commit a crime with a gun, I can get away with it. Chief Craig has this week formed a new fugitive apprehension unit. Nine officers whose entire job is going to be to follow up on these warrants and arrest every single person with an outstanding warrant for committing a gun crime. But we're going to back them with technology. We're adding license plate readers to our police officers' cars. Now, this has been done in a lot of places, and normally it's to get people without standing speeding tickets. So you might want to pay your speeding tickets if you've got them, uh, but that's not really what we're going after. We are taking this license plate reader technology, and we're loading the 1,000 wanted criminals with gun crimes, the cars they own, in there, so that any time a patrol car is going down the street, if they pass one of those cars from somebody who's wanted, an alert's going to go off in the patrol car and tell them to turn around and get them. This is modern technology. And then in April, we're going to load their pictures in. We've got their pictures from mugshots. We've got their pictures from Facebook page. It's amazing, the sophistication. And here's what we got. There's something now called facial recognition. 
We're going to load those thousand faces in, and every one of these guys goes in and fills up his car at the wrong gas station. The alert's going to go off and say, there's our wanted criminal. And this is the message that we have in this city. We're tired of the gun violence. We're not putting up with it anymore. We may not have the resources to get everybody, but we do have the resources to get those who commit a crime with a gun. And so what I say to everybody here is, our murder rate, even though it's been down three years in a row, is still five times higher than Boston or New York. In those cities, they settle their beefs without using guns. Whatever your beefs are, whatever your activities are, leave the guns at home. And that, I think, is going to be a strategy that will work. For those of you who are out there who are business people, for, for those of you who are out there who are business people and want to know what you can do to help, and, and I'm about to ask people to hire our young people for summer jobs. Uh, and if you would listen instead of shouting, I think this message would be important. Because if there are business people out there that can do something to help, we need summer jobs for our young people. Two years ago, we had only 2,500 kids in summer jobs. You could see them wandering the streets. So, Uh, so, last year, so I went to the people like Tanya Allen and Skillman and City Connect, and I said, you had 2,500 people last summer, how many apply? She said, 5,000. I said, fine, we're going to create 5,000 summer jobs. Alexis Wiley and our team went across the city. We lined up 5,000 summer jobs. We actually got 5,600 kids hired. But, Eleven thousand applied. These kids want to work. So this year we're redoubling our effort. We've set as a goal to hire eight thousand young people this summer. And if you've seen the effect it has on these young kids, they get a paycheck. They get to work on time. They know what it's like to dress at work. What it's like to talk at work. So a week ago Saturday, we had our first sign-up day at a church of the East Side. It opened at nine o'clock, and I went there. And at nine o'clock in the morning, there was a line more than a block long of 14 and 15 year old kids lining up to get a job for this summer. And I want to acknowledge at this point one of our partners in this, one of the people who's helping us build it to 8,000, and that's the man who believes in this deeply, Wayne County Executive Warren Evans. So if you want to help this summer, go to the Grow Detroit's Young Talent website. Hire a kid. It's $1,700. If you can't afford to pay the whole $700, we'll pay half. Take a kid, change a summer, change a life. I want to talk now about the neighborhoods, which you know is something I spent a lot of time on in the campaign. And every single person in our cabinet comes in in the morning trying to figure out what can we do to make the neighborhoods better. And at this point, uh, they work long enough hours every uh, day all week. I think they ought to be acknowledged, and I'd like to introduce our cabinet to you. Uh, our Deputy Mayor, Ike McKinnon. <laughs> Chief of Staff, Alexis Wiley. Chief Financial Officer, John Hill. You've met uh, Police Chief James Craig. The new Fire Commissioner, Eric Jones. Neighborhood Services Director, Charlie Beckham. Corporation Counsel, Butch Hollowell. Our Information Technology Head, Beth Niblock. Our Water Director, Gary Brown. Public Services Director, Dave Minardo. DDOT Director, Dan Dirks. Deputy Mayor for Economic Development, Carol O'Clericon. Our Civil Rights Director, Portia Roberson. Our Deputy Chief of Staff, Dave Masseron. Our Head of Government Affairs, Lisa House. And the guy who looks a little sleepy because he's a new father, our Chief Talent Officer, Brian Barnhill. And I do believe that every neighborhood has a future. Uh, but it's hard to have a future in your neighborhood if you're being removed for foreclosures. 
And do you remember what things were like a year ago? They were predicting this terrible crisis, this tsunami of foreclosures. 60,000 people were going to get notices. Except we didn't just sit around and say it's a crisis. We went up to Lansing with the help with our legislators, with the help with Republicans like Senator Arlen Meekoff. We put a bill through Lansing that for the first time allowed the treasurer to take people's back payments, spread them out over four or five years at a 6% interest rate, and allow them to stay in the house. And they said, well, who's going to do that? And with the teams that went out and knocked on the doors, we had 36,000 families that a year ago had a foreclosure notice that ended up staying in their houses because we got this worked out. <laughs> 36,000 families stayed in their homes. That's more households than the entire city of Southfield. I mean, think about what we did. We kept the equivalent of the city of Southfield in their homes through this legislation. It's what we can do when we work together. And in those neighborhoods, we are moving people into the households. You know what we're doing on the lawsuits. We're suing the people who've abandoned the houses. We're auctioning them on the website, buildingdetroit.org. We've had 600 families buy a house on our website and close and move in. 600 vacant houses are occupied now by families. In addition to that, Another 500 houses, we've partnered with churches and nonprofits, and they're renovating the houses for their congregation members to move them in. And another 1,000 people who we sued and said either fix up the house or get rid of it, they looked around their neighborhood and they said, geez, everything's getting better. They signed an agreement and they started fixing up their homes. You drive through the neighborhoods, you can see houses being fixed up from one corner of this city to the other. We're making some progress. But none of it matters if we can't demolish the houses that can't be saved. And we know how bad the blight is in this city. Uh, when I came in, the numbers were just overwhelming. And the city of Detroit had historically been knocking down about 25 houses a week. And when I looked into it, that was the most anybody was doing in America. But we had 40,000 vacant houses. And I took out my calculator. And at 25 a week, we would be done in 31 years. Okay? We can't live with that. And so we brought in Dave Minardo and the team. We dramatically ramped up the production. I won't tell you we didn't make any mistakes along the way, but we got up to 50 a week, 100 a week, 150 a week. And last week was amazing. We did something that's never been done in the country. We knocked down 4,000 houses in a single year. <laughs> the next big program on the federal system, the next biggest state is the state of Ohio. The entire state of Ohio knocked down 1,000 houses. Detroit knocked down four times as many houses as the next largest state. That's how remarkable what we're doing are. And at this point, I do want to take the time to thank President Obama and Governor Snyder, who backed us in the allocation of these funds and got us the ability to do this. The problem was that in April, we were going to run out of money. And we said, what are we going to do? But I sat down with Senator Debbie Stabenow, and she says, you know, uh, at the end of the year, we have this big thing in Washington where we have this uh, uh, chicken contest where we threaten to shut down the government. And she says, whatever the nonsense is in the local media, across the country, Republicans and Democrats admire the Detroit demolition program as a national model. She says, I think I might be able to get $2 billion in funding out of that uh, out of that bill to replicate Detroit's demolition program and take it across America. And she went off as a minority member of the Senate and started to talk to people. And then Dan Gilbert got involved and said, this is a great idea. And he started phoning his folks, who were a little bit different than Debbie's folks. Uh, <laughs> and then we got uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of the largest bank in America, J.P. Morgan Chase, who's been in these houses with me several times. And I called and I said, I need your help. He got on the phone and called Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. And in the middle of the government shutdown debate, he says, you've got to get this demo funding so people can do what Detroit's doing. And they said, the president of J.P. Morgan Chase is calling for Detroit? And then we had some issues with some Democrats. And so Jesse Jackson stepped in and made some key calls, backed by Reverend Wendell Anthony and our own congressional delegation, John Conyers and Brenda Lawrence and Dan Kildee, and then Candace Miller went and worked the Republican side. And at the end of the day, 
a miracle happen. Two billion dollars in new funding for demolition in this country. It's going to be a while before the allocation is done, but we will, in the next few weeks, be sending an application up to the state of Michigan for enough money to con continue for another four months. And today, everybody here knows, especially our district managers who do such a great job, everybody knows where the boundaries are, because the feds say we can only demolish within a boundary. We are going to ask the state and the federal government for a boundary expansion, and I expect it to be granted, and if it is, by this summer, our demolition zone in this city will include 90% of all residents of the city of Detroit. And our goal is to go from 3,500 demolitions in 2014 to 4,000 last year to 5,000 this year to 6,000 next year. By the end of 2017, we'll have 20,000 houses down. We'll be halfway through. I won't tell you the problem will be solved, but we're handling it in a way that nobody thought. But what about the people who are behind in these neighborhoods? One of the things that has been so frustrating, and everybody in Detroit knows this, if you've got a good paying job and you want to buy a house in Detroit, you can't get a mortgage, right? We all know that. In fact, last year, 3,000 houses sold in Detroit, only 500 could get a mortgage. And here's what happens. It has nothing to do with credit scores or pay. It has to do with the appraisals. Because the Detroit property values have lagged in their recovery, appraisers look backwards. So you'll have somebody who's got a good paying job who agrees to buy a house for $60,000. And the appraiser comes back and says, now nah, in the last two years, it's only worth $50,000. And under the rules after the last crisis, the bank can't make that mortgage. Doesn't matter what the person makes. But that person can go to Southfield or Warren or Redford and get a $100,000 mortgage and move out of town. And that's what's been happening to us. But now it's about to change. And again, we had the help of President Obama. We had the help of Governor Snyder. We had the help, interestingly enough, of former President Bill Clinton who convened everybody, the Clinton Global Initiative in December. We got the Kresge Foundation. And we got... I don't really get this. I'm, a, I'm more against emergency manager than anybody I ever met. <laughs> All right. Some of these protests are in the wrong room. So here's what we did. We got the banks together, Talmer and Huntington and First Merit and Flagstar and Liberty. And they've agreed now to something we call the Detroit Home Mortgage, that if you can afford to buy that house for $60,000, they will make that mortgage to you. You go in in the ordinary course of business, and they're going to work that out with the support of Kresge and the State Housing Authority. Uh, you no longer have to leave this city. If you are paying $800 or $1,000 or $1,200 a month in rent, it is a great time to buy in the city of Detroit, and now you can get a mortgage to do it. If you just want to fix your house up, we have another 400 zero percent loans this year. It's been one of our most successful programs for low and moderate homeowners who are replacing furnaces and roofs and the like. Go to the Detroit Opportunities website because those of you who stayed here, we want to make sure that you can improve your house and benefit from the values that are increasing. If you want the side lot, we've now sold 3,300 side lots. You can go across the city, and you can see people fencing them in. Last Saturday, I went to a side lot fair, and I met a gentleman who had his deed who said he's been cutting that side lot since 1989. And now he walked out with the deed. He finally owed it. I told him, you deserve it. I feel bad. We charged you the 100 bucks. Uh, but we're now letting people get control of their own neighborhoods. And the thing that bothers me about as much as anything are the scrappers. We had support again from our Detroit legislators and a Republican, Senator Mike Kowal, and passed a bill to crack down on the, the scrap buyers. And if you saw the report on Channel 7, the Detroit scrapyard owners have actually done a good job honoring the bill. We're making progress. And I'm really pleased that the head of the state police, Christy Etchew, has agreed, if you saw that TV report, they're going out to the suburban scrapyards and aren't enforcing the law. But the state police are now going to go enforce the law in the areas around us. But we want to go a step further. And so Chief Craig is today announcing that if you dial 911, the police will respond to a call for scrapping. And they won't just ticket them. 
The police are going to arrest them and haul them away. It's about time we treat the scrappers the way they deserve, the way they've torn apart our neighbors. So test it out. Call 911 and see if the police don't come out and arrest them. Uh, we are going to start to protect these neighborhoods. So the results, I keep saying to you, I want to be judged on whether the population is going up or is going down. A year ago, I stood here and said to you, there are 12 neighborhoods in the city of Detroit uh, where property values went up. And people all said, ooh, 12 neighborhoods, I wonder where they are. We've got the results from last year. And more than 60 neighborhoods have grown in sales price more than 20% from the east side to the west side to southwest Detroit. Our property values are coming back because people are moving back in. Now there's a range on the west side in Warrendale and over on this part of town in Conan Gardens in Regent Park. The sales prices went from 9,000 a year ago to 12,000 last year. That's some progress. If you go to the southwest central, they went from 19,000 to 29,000 in one year. If you have the good fortune to live in Russell Woods near Livernoy and Davison, they went from 11,000 to 30,000 in one year. In Rosedale, they've gone from 52,000 to 63,000. And if anybody here is from Sherwood Forest, you already know this, but in one year the property values went from 156,000 to $234,000. People are moving back into this city. And now, you can get a mortgage. But we still have a third of our neighborhoods where the property values went down. And our charge this year is to extend everything we're doing so I can stand here next year and tell you we don't have 60 neighborhoods, we have 100 neighborhoods. Because that's how we're going to grow away our way out of our financial issues. We get people moving back and the property values coming up. Car insurance, we got our work cut out for us. And I know Lansing has got some major things, but we're going to get back to it before the year's over. Michigan is paying the highest car insurance in America, and Detroit is paying the highest in Michigan. And we all know the reasons. We are getting ripped off by the health care industry. It is disgraceful. No fault is no choice. If you go to a doctor today for an MRI, and you happen to have Medicare, your doctor gets paid $600 for that MRI. If you go to that doctor today and you have Blue Cross, that doctor gets paid $800 for that MRI. So you, if it looks like they like the Blue Cross people better, that you might be right. But if you go in with car insurance, that doctor gets paid $3,300 for that MRI. And the same thing's true for CT scan. The same thing is true for physical therapy. When the no-fault law was passed, this was never intended. But right now, the way the no-fault structured, no fault is no choice. You have uh, only two options. You either pay the highest insurance in America, or you drive as a criminal. And half of our folks are driving as criminals. And so I want to thank Senator Burt Johnson who supported our bill, and we've got the de-insurance bill out of the Senate Insurance Committee and through to the Senate floor. And what de-insurance says is, you get a choice. Detroit, if you want to keep paying that $3,300 MRI, you want to keep that insurance, you can do it. But if you want to have an alternative that will knock your cost down 30 percent and pay these doctors and hospitals what Blue Cross and Medicare rate, you can buy de-insurance, and you can afford insurance, and you can drive legally. De-insurance will decriminalize our residents. On the job front, it's been a pretty remarkable year. Ally Financial bringing 1,500 jobs they're consolidating downtown. Sakti Automotive, 650 manufacturing jobs at the site of the old Southwest High School. The Maroons building a distribution center not far from here for 150 jobs. American Axle adding 100 jobs in advanced manufacturing. We have 8,000 more Detroiters today working than we did two years ago. And yet, we still have the highest unemployment rate in Michigan ahead of Pontiac and Inkster and Port Huron. We're making progress, but we've got a long way to go. But as these jobs keep coming in, 
there are opportunities to be hired. On the skilled trade side, Council President Brenda Jones and Don O'Connell have been working this for years. There are opportunities at places like the hockey arena for carpenters and electricians and pipe fitters. Go to the Detroit Opportunities website on our homepage, and you can get into these pre-apprenticeship programs, and we will track you into these jobs. There are jobs open today in the city for auto mechanics, for truck drivers, for IT jobs, a whole range of, of jobs all available at the Opportunities page for returning citizens with the encouragement of Council Member Janae Ayers. We've established a program where we're reaching into the Ryan Correctional Facility and Mound Row. And, and we are, we are, So we are identifying people who are going to be released from prison in 6 to 12 months. We're lining them up for jobs. And I'm so proud of companies like Sakti and DMS and Payne Landscaping and Comprehensive Logistics. They have already hired more than 100 returning citizens into their companies. And you know what they say? The CEO of Sakti tells me that when he hires an ex-felon, that person is more likely to be at work, to be there on time. He's more afraid that he won't be able to find another job, that our returning citizens are many of their best workers. If our companies will just give them another chance, you're going to find in many cases they have a great deal to contribute. and the entrepreneurial opportunities as businesses come back, as people come back. You know, they're building 2,000 new housing units in this city right now. People are moving back. Another 2,000 are under construction, and Mary Sheffield's making sure that everything we're involved in has at least 20% affordable component, so the city is being built for everybody. But with those people come business opportunities. We can have entrepreneurs, and we're building that entrepreneurial class now. Motor City Match. Every single quarter, I got some winners here. Every single quarter is giving out $500,000 to the best new business ideas in this town. We've awarded several companies from people who are opening restaurants to tech companies to bridal shops to daycare centers. I guess I got the bridal shop winner here to a new pharmacy. Isn't Motor City Match great? But this is how we grow this, is with entrepreneurs starting their own companies. And I'm just so pleased with J.P. Morgan Chase that started an Entrepreneur of Colors Fund, a $6.5 million fund to start the, these businesses. And as we go into this program, of all of our programs, 70% of all the loans we made have been to people of color, entrepreneurs of color from Detroit. And for me, everything's personal. And so I'm driving not too far from my neighborhood at Van Dyke and Kirchival, and there's this old closed NBD building, bank building, been closed as long as I can remember. One day somebody's in there working. I stop to see what they're doing. They're building condos in the upper levels. I said, wow, this neighborhood's coming back. And then they start to do shops. And the day they open, I go in to see the folks, to see what are these new stores. And I meet a young woman named Kelly Jones who you're about to meet because she's here tonight. And she has a flower shop. She calls goodness gracious alive. And so I say to Ms. Jones, uh, how did you happen to do this? And she says, as a little girl, I grew up in this neighborhood. And as a six and seven year old girl, I come up to the bank because my dad worked in this NBD branch in the neighborhood. I walk up and see him working as a clerk as a girl. She got older, she joined the Marines and served our country. And when she came back, she moved back into her east side neighborhood. She had a gift for flowers, so she went on the side. She opened a flower shop out of her garage, and she drew such crowds. She's so gifted at it, it got bigger that when she saw the building being reopened, she went and talked to him about opening up her business. Kelly Jones today 
has opened her business in the same space her father worked 30 years ago. And when I went in to see her, and when I went in to see her, she was sitting with her 11-year-old daughter, Kelsey, who joins her there after work every day. And you could tell is so proud of her mom. And you think about the story of this city. I look at 11-year-old Kelsey, and I think, when Kelly was a girl, she went up and her dad had a good job, but her dad worked for NBD. When Kelsey goes up, she goes into a place where her mom's the boss, her mom owns the company. She's growing up thinking, I don't have to work for anybody. I can start my own company. I can be my own boss. <laughs> Kelly and Kelsey Jones, please stand up. And the only good decision I made was when I went in, you're not going to believe this, but Kelsey had a chess board out. And she challenged me to a game of chess, but this is what experience does for you. I didn't play her. Uh, so, but if you're looking for flowers or a chess game, over at Van Dyke and Kerchival, goodness gracious alive. The last thing I want to talk about is what's going on in the Detroit public schools. Uh, and I don't know that there's an area that has been more misunderstood. We are approaching now the seventh year anniversary of state management of the Detroit public schools. They started with Governor Jennifer Granholm in 2009. This is not a partisan thing. This has gone across both parties. It's been going on for seven years. And in those seven years, they have run a deficit every single year. The number of students in our schools has gone down from 80,000 to 40,000. The achievement in those schools is the worst in America. It isn't working. But if you go beyond that, we have in the city 100 public schools, we have 100 charter schools. And we have some very good charter schools as we have some very good public schools. But we've got some not so good schools. But do you realize in the city, as the charters open and close all over the city, in the seven years the state's been in charge, 80% of the schools in the city of Detroit have opened or closed in the last seven years. These kids are going to three different schools by the time they're in sixth grade. This isn't working, and something needs to change. Uh, I have not, and I, I don't want, I don't believe the mayor should run the Detroit public schools, and I don't want to run the Detroit public schools. But I do think the mayor has a role and I started to find that role when the teachers came to me and said, you've got to come through and look at these building conditions. And I said, we do have a right to inspect the buildings. And I went through that day, and I could not believe what I found. Uh, and since then, our building safety and engineering team and our health teams have gone through. They've inspected 67 buildings. You can look on our website and see all the inspections. And I have to say the thing I am encouraged about is every single school is now on a signed consent agreement. They have to make the repairs or we're taking them to court. But the good thing is the facilities people at Detroit Public Schools are starting to fix the schools. Uh, they, whether, we're making some progress. The problem is that the schools weren't the worst of it. What I saw at 40 kids to a classroom, what I saw when I went into a school on the east side uh, and walked into a school and saw a group of kindergartners in winter coats at 10.30 in the morning. And I walked in, and a little girl recognizes me. She runs right over me, big smile on her face, and says, come on in. Takes me by the hand to sit her down, and she's coloring on, on a paper. And I look at her and I say, do you always have to wear a coat in this classroom? And she's colored and she says, oh no. And she looks up at me and she gives me a big smile. And she says, most days, by lunchtime, it warms up enough I can take off my coat. And she went back to her color. This is the way that our children are having to learn. And so there are lots of people on lots of sides of these issues, but what I would say is this. The deficit that's been run up is the state's responsibility. I think everybody acknowledges that. But it needs to be paid in a way that doesn't take money from other school children, from other districts of the state. They're important too. We can't be stealing from children to support children. We need to return the Detroit public schools to the local elected officials at the earliest possible date.
And if we could get the legislature to act in March, we could have an election this August. It's a nonpartisan race. We don't need to have Democratic and Republican primaries. We could imagine what would happen in this city if you knew you were electing your school board this August. The best and brightest people would come out. People would pay attention. And we would be ready to take back control of the schools. This is what we need to do. We have here uh, today with us somebody that I do want to acknowledge. He's the Republican senator leading this issue from Muskegon. And this is, he's been an amazing guy. He has been down here week after week in the schools, talking to people, learning. You have somebody who lives four hours away and who's here because he actually cares. He's got his work cut out for him, but I just want to say a special thank you to Senator Jeff Hansen for being yeah. here. And so I will be up in Lansing pushing every single day to have the public schools back in the hands of the elected school board. I also do believe there is a role for a mayor in what I call the Detroit Education Commission. Because right now what's happening in the city is schools open and close with no pattern. We had in, 18, in an 18 month period in southwest Detroit, we had 12 schools open and close in one area. And yet, in a 15-square-mile area near Brightmoor, there's, no Brightmoor, there's no high school at all. Somebody needs to be in charge to say, this is where we need these schools. We need to have a single standard. I am a true believer in school choice. I think every parent has a right to decide whether to send their kid to a public school or a charter school. I want good public schools and good charter schools, and I want a Detroit Education Commission. And so... There are lots of good people on lots of sides of this issue. And as I finish tonight, uh, I just want uh, to direct this not just to the parents of Detroit, but the parents in any community who are listening, to think about the urgency of this. We need the Detroit school legislation to get done. It has to get finished. And I would ask you to think about this. If it were your children, if you lived in a school district where you had five separate superintendents in five years, as we've had emergency managers, if you lived in a school district that had 80% of its schools open and close in the last seven years, if you had a school district that had four credit rating downgrades in the last five years, what would you do? And then think about the children in the city of Detroit schools. And when you think about a five-year-old girl sitting in a coat who just wants to learn and the fact that the system has failed her, I'd ask you to urge your reps and your senators. We need to get this done. Let's find a compromise, let's get a bill passed, and let's get the Detroit schools back in the hands of our local elected officials. Because when we do, we're going to have a city where not just every neighborhood has a future, but every child has a future. Thank you so much for being here. Devin, he ended on an up note after, even though he was interrupted, what, maybe four times by outburst in the, in the auditorium or inside the church, but uh, he's waited patiently to continue on covering his focus for the city of Detroit, a very passionate one, and in a spear of, or a spirit of real partnership with the city council and certainly with the uh, police department and the citizenry. Pretty ecumenical Detroit. address, absolutely right. We're going to talk about it over on clickondetroit.com. The mayor, uh, mayor's comments running a little long, partly because of those interruptions, right. no doubt. So we're going to join Hollywood Game Night already in progress here on the broadcast side. But head over to clickondetroit.com. Our conversation about this year's State of the City Address from Mayor Mike Duggan continues there on Click on Detroit. We'll see you back here tonight for Local 4 News at 11.